can you ever actually be intimate with absolute certainty? No, ab absolutely not. That will never happen. And therefore, OCD isn't the best way to approach intimacy and perfectionism isn't. Intimacy is awkward and messy and weird and all sorts of things. <laughs> Welcome to OCD Whisperer Show. Today with me, I have an incredible guest, Dr. Patrick McGrath, who is the author of the OCD Answer Book and Don't Try Harder, Try Different. In addition to treating countless of patients with OCD, he's also trained clinicians on CBT and exposure response prevention, and he is the Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. So good to be here. Thrilled uh, to have some time to chat. Absolutely. So I prepared some questions for you. And some of the things are actually things that I, I hear quite often from audience members. So one of the first ones I want to ask you is, what would you say is the number one thing that goes to D to getting better? Oh, wow. That's a great question. The number one, I don't know, but I, I can give you a couple that I could think are, are toward the top. One would be, as I'll paraphrase my buddy, Brett Deacon, he would say wussy exposures, basically meaning that you're not taking them out to the degree. Now, there's a lot of debate around that as well, too. I'm not talking about sticking your hand in a toilet and drinking the water. We, that, that's not what... <laughs> and please, let's just eliminate that rumor from this that we even do such a thing because <laughs> we'd stop. That would be just amazingly great. But it would be, let, let's say that I wanted you to sit on the floor and then eat some chips without washing your hands, right? Well, that's something people do all the time. You go over to someone's house, you sit down, you grab things, there's a bowl of chips going around, you grab everyone else is doing that kind of thing as well too. And getting somebody to fully engage in something like that without any safety behavior. So really that's what I mean is that doing ERP without safety behaviors, even the most subtlest of safety behaviors are going to be some of the things that aren't going or that are going to really interfere with your ability to get better. Another one I, th I think would be not practicing ERP as well too. If you just go to piano lessons for half an hour a week and that's the only time you play piano, you're only gonna get about a half hour better each week at most, right? And a similar thing would happen in ERP. Don't look at your therapy sessions as that's where the corrective experience happens. Look at your day-to-day -day life as where corrective experiences happen. And you're going to learn the next corrective things to do over the course of the next week or two or whatever in the therapy sessions. But you really got to take that outside of those therapy sessions and make sure that you're doing those things. Because if you're not practicing them, you, they're not becoming just a general part of your life. And that means compulsions are staying a part of your life instead of the new learning that you're getting out of doing all of the ERP work. So fully engaging in ERP without subtle safety behaviors, practicing ERP and making sure that you're doing it daily, I think is best multiple times a day would be great too. And then I think probably the third thing could be the thing that trips people up at least is not recognizing OCD when it's OCD. One of the things I hear all the time and the trick of OCD even is, that, well, now that I don't do the compulsions anymore, does that mean that I like the thought or the image or the urge? And now I want it. And so I really try to teach people what are the OCD tricks, even after you're getting better, that OCD is always going to try to bring you back into the realm of OCD and doing compulsions. Because remember, uh, OCD eats compulsions for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's the koala of disorders. Koalas eat eucalyptus leaves only. OCD only eats compulsions. That's how it survives. And it's always going to try to get you to do compulsions. And so not being fooled by the, oh, well, but there's this new one now. And, and I don't know if this one's OCD. Yeah, you do. Walk you through, practice what you've done. And that could be a big impediment for people is that they don't take what they've learned and apply it to the new things. Anytime there's a new thing, it's like, oh, I've never experienced anything like this before. Actually, you have tons of times. And let's get you to recognize that and know how to be able to do this for yourself so that you don't need me. I love working myself out of a job. I'd love to see only a couple of hours a year just as some booster sessions. That would be <laughs> That's funny, but I do love the koala example. I think that's exactly right. And you're totally on point. It's, I think, very commonly what folks see is that somehow something new or somehow if it's different, it's that somehow it's just yeah <laughs> almost bewildering, is, right? Like, yes. I'm, right. Instead of like recognizing, well, once you learn what OCD is, like some of the feelings and the signs, it's just looking for all the different flavors that can show up. But really, you're going to feel that familiar feeling. You're going to feel that familiar drive and urge. Yeah. 
Well, right. with that, then let kind of, I want to dive into a topic of perfectionism for a moment. This sure. is actually something that I've had listeners ask about, and I thought you'd be such a great person for this question, which is how would you say perfectionism OCD impacts a person's desire for intimacy and or sex? Well, if you can't envision being able to perform perfectly, you may not want to perform at all. And so you may just pull away from everybody, right? I mean, if there's any kind of doubt that's going to be in kind of sexual performance or intimate experience, do I want to put myself out there and be in some situation where there's going to be doubt and uncertainty? And then if I am with someone and I don't perform well, or if there's doubt or uncertainty, what will they think about me? And that would be horrible if somebody were to judge me negatively. And so OCD, let me, let me just sidetrack one second. OCD likes to tell you it's your best friend and it's ultimately out there for your best interest. So, hey, don't go into this situation until 100% that everything's going to be okay, right? So maybe it's best just to stay away for now, but we'll come back later. And that's like Alice in Wonderland, never jam today, but always jam tomorrow, right? The, well, that, oh, good, jam tomorrow. Yay, everyone, we get jammed tomorrow. Right? Well, then tomorrow comes and it's, oh, no, not today, but tomorrow. That's the OCD thing. It's the constant carrot in front of the horse that it never achieves. It's the Sisyphus thing where you never get the bus going up to the top of the hill. And so in this situation, can you ever actually be intimate with absolute certainty? No, ab absolutely not. That will never happen. And therefore, OCD isn't the best way to approach intimacy and perfectionism isn't. Intimacy is awkward and messy and weird and all sorts of things. So the notion for it to be perfect, I, I think, is things that we see in movies and television series and things of that nature. But I don't know about you, but the first time I've kissed people, it's always been exciting and exhilarating and weird and awkward all at the same time. And <laughs> that's what, to me, makes it fun and cool. <laughs> it's not, okay, at 7.53 tonight, after finishing the creme brulee and rinsing our mouths out with some water, we will then commence the first kiss in the relationship. <laughs> and it will last for 42 seconds. And then after that, we will hold hands as we walk down to the, get a, a ride home or something. Like that. I mean, oh, that's the way it is. But <laughs> but as ridiculous as the OCD is, it says, well, that's maybe it should be that everything will be predictable and you'll know how everything's going to go and it will be all planned out and then all will be great. Boy, I hope none of us ever have a life that's like that because that just sounds amazingly boring, actually. Right. Incredibly boring. As you're talking about that, it also brings up the question, and quite a few people, of course, will speak to this where sometimes when, when you have that OCD attack, the kind of insurmountable it feels like in the moment right mm -hmm. degree of panic and and that intensity of those feelings takes over and i guess what would you say to anybody listening like how can they wrap their brain around that like what could they do about that when that kind of hits well it's always okay to tap out for a few minutes right if you need to step out of a situation and collect yourself and get yourself back in the game that's okay I think one of the worst things you could probably do in an OCD way of doing this is I have to stay right here and I have to figure all this out. And maybe if I just sneak in a couple of compulsions, then it'll make it better. And Oh, that wasn't good enough. So then I've got to do it again because now I've got the pressure of people being there and watching me. And so how can I make this really subtle without looking weird and things? So you know what? If you're not ready in that situation to handle that, remove yourself, get yourself together, pull yourself into the game without doing a compulsion. That's like on the NoCD app, we have the SOS button and that's what that's for. Like if you're really feeling that urge to do a compulsion, you can hit that and you can hear me walking you through some steps of sitting in response prevention, right? And that's ultimately what we want. Now, it'd be great eventually if in a situation, you're able to stay there through the whole experience and you're able to do your response prevention. And even if some OCD throws some kind of grenade at you, you'll be able to be like, huh, and deflect that thing and it goes flying back off again. That's great. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging I'm having an intrusive thought or image or urge. If your goal is to never have them, we're screwed, right? That I don't know how to help anybody with that. I haven't, I, I either missed that class in graduate school or, or we haven't figured it out one or the other. So you, you have to have established great goals for yourself and make sure that they're attainable goals. What is not an attainable goal? I'll never have an intrusive thought during an intimate experience. What is an attainable goal 
even if I have an intrusive thought or image or urge during an intimate experience, I'll be able to live with it, handle it, and move on and stay in the moment without it taking me out of the game. That's really well said. And with that, I mean, I can imagine anybody listening right now, of course, that the one thing everybody always wants to know is what can you do if you're struggling in the moment of sex or intimacy? Yeah, just anything that you're willing to share. Obviously, anybody listening, we understand this is not treatment. This is not like, but globally, just from your expertise, what would you say could be something that a person can do either to prep or when they're in the kind of throes of things and wanting to engage sexually and intimately and and all this kind of comes up, what could they do? I'm going to take it out of intimacy for a moment, just to give you an example and then bring it back in. I once worked with somebody who was teased relentlessly by all of his brothers. He was like the youngest of multiple children. And we took all of the words that his brothers used to call him and we put him on a loop tape and we had him listen to it for hours. The first two hours were pretty rough. Hour three was neutral. Hour four, he came to me and said he was pretty bored. Could he stop it? And by hour, and I said, I'm glad you're bored. Keep listening to it. And by hour five, he was like, you know what? I can't believe that for years, these stupid words have influenced my life and made me miserable because all they are words and absolutely ridiculous. And I'm not going to allow them to rule my life anymore. So imagine now doing something very similar to whatever kinds of intrusive thoughts pop into your head during intimacy. And in times of not being intimate, practicing, allowing yourself to be with those things and learn that you can handle them so that when they do occur, then they're not so bad. We do this for panic with interoceptive exposures, right? We purposely create symptoms one at a time by shaking your head or hyperventilating or breathing through a straw or spinning to teach you that if any of these symptoms like dizziness or lightheadedness or discombobulation happen to you, that you don't have to go into a panic attack. You can be like, oh, wait, I practiced this. I learned how to handle this. This doesn't have to interfere in my life. Well, What if we approached intimacy that way? The most common things that pop in your head while you're trying to be intimate, let's use those as the fodder of our ERP work and expose people to whatever those thoughts or images or urges are and do response prevention by allowing yourself to be with those, not doing any kind of neutralization of those at all. And after a while, I'm going to bet you're going to have a lot less reaction to those things when you learn. I can handle it and I don't have to do a compulsion. I think that's a pretty interesting concept. Obviously, I know it and people have heard about it and they read it, but I love what you're hitting on there for anybody listening, because I I think that's exactly right. When we have thoughts, especially if they're uncomfortable and unpleasant, like I think it's a normal human experience to want to push them away and just to not be feeling uncomfortable. I think that's just a, a natural drive we all have. But if you have them and they're there and they are part of your life, well, then how can you learn to be with it and live with it so that you're not just constantly basically arguing and creating more kind of suffering and pain by trying to wish this thing away? It's like, well, you can't wish this thing away. It's just there. So like, let's figure out a way to work with it. In my own life. So I live in the house that I lived in with my wife, Susan, who died last year. She was sick for six years. She was in this house for six and a half years. So we were only here for about six months before she got sick. I don't walk around every moment going, oh, Susan was in that chair. Oh, Susan got used that refrigerator. Oh, Susan, am I reminded of her? Sure. There's pictures of her in the house and things and I'm reminded of her, but I can imagine if I had some kind of issue with intrusive thoughts or images or urges, I'd not be able to do anything here because I'd only see her here the entire time. And I'd move, right? I just, I got to get the hell out of here. I can't stay in this situation. This is is what an awful, horrible place I need to go. Instead, I can allow for the fact that her memory is with everything in this place, but it doesn't have to interfere with my ability to enjoy my home. And I can have other people come over and enjoy it as well, too. And it could be a very fun place. I've had parties and things of that nature. Sure. Do we talk about Susan? Yeah, all the time. But it still comes up. Heck, just at the conference this weekend, how many people came up to me and said, oh, I know your wife died right after the conference last year. How are you doing? You know, I had that conversation multiple times. And I'm so glad I had that conversation. I'm so happy that people were checking in on me and wondering how I was doing. And is the conference forever going to be associated with, yeah, I came back home and then she died quickly afterwards? For sure. But you know what? I'm still going to go to the conference. 
and I'm still going to enjoy the conference. And I can have that experience, that memory, that relationship with those two things without it interfering in how I approach my work and the world that I live. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for sharing that. I know that's a you know, deeply personal experience. And yeah, I just really appreciate that. And also what I hear the humanity in it, which is letting going through the natural progression of loss, grief, emotions, and then not getting stuck and living there, but saying, okay, there, there's that time for that. And now let's take the next step and embrace yeah. the next breath of life because I am still here. And so, okay, how else are we going to do this? Exactly. It's a day-to-day -day experience and I hopefully get a little bit better at it every day. And I still op will open a drawer that I realized I hadn't opened for a long time and there's something of hers in there. And I'll have a little, oh, yeah, I remember what she got. And it's like, okay. That I'm honoring her memory and things, but I also might not want that thing. And so it's going to go in the donation pile or the recycle pile or something of that nature. I can even allow for some of those things to go away. I think of hoarding where people would see that and think, if I get rid of this thing, I'll lose the memory of the person. So I have to hold on to it to have the memory. Well, we know that we don't have to have things to hold on to memories. That's the case. And that's what we try to teach our friends who have hoarding issues is how to be able to recognize that the thing is not what's important to the memory as well. Exactly right. And also the piece you said about that association, and I think that's very true for everybody with OCD, right? We are going to have certain associations linked together, mm -hmm. like the first time I have a panic attack or the mm -hmm. first time I have that OCD break and don't know what's happening to me. I think I'm losing my mind. Those things are real. They're there. But again, understanding that's just like anything in life where you'll have certain things that happen at the same time and they will just get linked. but like you said, if you keep choosing to live and move forward and one just one day at a time, that's all it is, you get to rebuild that relationship with that thing. And so it doesn't have to take over your entire life. You grow from it. You deepen from it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. OCD loves to put emotional contaminants on things. There's something bad about this thing or this area and how much then that emotional contamination can spread as well, too. So I know exactly where Susan and I were when she told me she had told that she had cancer. And it was our dining room table. I haven't thrown the table out. And I also haven't taken that chair and put a caution tape around it saying, this chair is emotionally contaminated with cancer because this is where I learned that my wife had cancer. I sit there. Other people sit there and, and we allow for that. But if I had OCD, that would be a contaminated spot because a really horribly emotionally a bad experience occurred there. And now anyone who touches it and then touches my couch, now my couch has the contaminant on it, and then the bathroom, and then their car, because then they got in their car, and now they're home because they've gone home and they probably didn't wash their hands when they went home. And then anyone who went in their home. And then just by exponential, within about a month and a half, the entire world is going to be covered in emotionally cancer germs because enough people have interacted with enough people who have spread this thing around and things. So I wasn't going to, but I think I'm going to just make the statement because I think it's ironic we're touching on these points. So, cause I have OCD and my mom has been battling with cancer for two and a half years. Wow. And there was definitely a period of time when that word or anything like watching movies where suddenly it's all cancer. Or, and then suddenly a lot of people that I've known would come forward and talk about how their family or somebody else. And Oh yeah. It was <laughs> That's an so, automatic. Yeah. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And it was so intense that I'm like, dude, I don't want to, yeah. like, I don't want to hear it. I just don't even want to hear the word. I don't want to talk about it. Part of OCD. Like, yeah, it became this thing too. Like I remember at some point I started working out way extraneously. It was like suddenly like not eating anything unless it's clean and only this one way. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? And recognizing where OCD showed up that way suddenly. And I was like, wait yeah. a minute, no girlfriend, we're going to cut this out. You're going to have your M&Ms. You're going to just skip and hang out and cha change immediately those behaviors sure. because it's exactly right. OCD definitely wants to latch on immediately. And every time that I'm at OCD conferences or other presentations, it's just so interesting how many times people will make exa use examples like cancer oh, when we're uh, talking to patients. And I'm like, I just sit there yeah. going, mm, yep, okay. I know. Oh, I, I laugh at it. And then people, after they make that now, they look at me and go, oh, I saw We even played a game. When in the TV show we're watching, will cancer come up? Because I don't care what you're yeah. watching. In some series, some character or character's mom or dad or cousin yep. or whatever will have had cancer yep. and it's going to come up. 
right? Yep. And now I've treated people who would like, I won't watch television anymore because I can't even watch commercials about the Susan B. Coleman Breast Cancer Foundation. Or I don't want to drive anymore because I don't want to see those damn ribbons on the backs of mm-hmm. freaking cars all over the place. <laughs> so I'm just going to isolate myself in this one room where no one will ever talk about cancer or mm-hmm. put whatever other obsession word is going to be in there. And yeah, it's about living your life and not the life that OCD wants you to live. And, exactly. and OCD has is such a manipulator and is so convincing that there is a possibility of having the life that you want to live if you just do everything I tell you to do. And yet we as health practitioners would never say to someone, you seem a little down today. Have you thought about some more OCD? Because that might be really helpful to you. Because OCD knows all of the, the right moves and the things to do in order to be better. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I have to say, I really appreciate this conversation, and uh, yeah, just the vulnerability. Yeah, yeah I think um, I'm an open book, so I you love can it. Ask anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you for coming on. I thank you for giving me your time. And if anybody wants to find you, how can they find you? Right at NoCD. So www.nocd.com. Check us out. Download the NoCD app and check us out there. I do a Wednesday night webinar through NoCD every Wednesday night, and then. On the uh, second Mondays of every month, we do an OCD and substance use disorder webinar as well, too, because it's another area that I'm really interested in is the combination of OCD and substance use. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. 